Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're talking about the Lomi electric composter or just electric composters in general. Um, what exactly is in the byproduct? How do you use the byproduct properly? All that fun stuff. So I first want to start this video off by saying it is not sponsored by Lomi. It's just that Lomi was the only one that actually answered my email. Shame on the rest of you. Uh, Ninja didn't answer my email. How dare that? I'm just kidding. Honestly, I was expecting none of them to answer my emails because my YouTube channel is like not big enough to warrant them to answer my emails. But Lomi actually did hook me up with the engineering department, uh, which is kind of cool. So they answered all my questions in great detail. And uh, I mean, obviously put a little bit of their bias spin on it, but I'll pick away at that for you guys give you an honest answer here. This is not for someone who doesn't have $400 just to blow willy nilly. I will straight out tell you that right now. Do not buy this if it's not in the budget to buy this. Just do Bokashi composting. You will be just fine just fine. Do Bokashi composting, start a bare compost bin. You can buy a lot of worms for $400. I'll tell you that much. So just something to keep in mind there. I would recommend this to someone who has it in the budget or who has a very, very small area area to actually set this sort of stuff up and doesn't want like a worm bin in the living room type thing because they only live in a condo. It's just, it's expensive. And I don't think it's worth that amount of money. But let's just jump into exactly what's going on with the Lomi uh, specifically, I can't comment on the other ones because they didn't answer my emails. So I asked, one of the questions I asked is what is the temperature reading on the device? And they said it gets up to 70 degrees Celsius, but it varies between temperatures depending on the time and what the sensors are saying. So it's not getting overly warm. It's not cooking. I would say it is dehydrating and grinding more so than like cooking anything and burning it up. So that's nice to know because that means that it is just a regular kind of composting process and that we're not necessarily denaturing or harming any bacterial, fungal, um, or just natural um, bugs in that system, which is good to hear. So that was one of my first questions I did ask. I also asked if there has been any uh, composition studies done by the product. And the first thing they did say is that the NPK and all the micronutrients is all going to be dependent on what you put in to the composter, which is what I kind of expected the answer to be only because your Vera compost, your compost compost, your Bokashi compost, you name it, is all going to have varying levels of NPK, S, and micronutrients based on what you put in it. So if you have a Vera compost where you're just feeding the worms eggs, obviously you're going to have very low nitrogen, potentially high potassium and calcium, you know, that's sort of, that is something to think about there. But they also did say they got everything third party tested for micronutrients, macronutrients, trace metals, pH, electric conductivity, maturity and stability, organic carbon content, and pathogens. And by pathogens, they mean Enterococcus, E. coli, and fecal coliforms. Now, did I get my hands on any of the results of these studies? No. I didn't. They did not send me that. So I do not know what the pH is. I do not know what the EC is. I do not know what maturity and stability is even referring to or what that means. I'm assuming it's talking about um, like with compost, we have to age it for two to three months before we put it in our gardens to avoid basically incredibly stunted plants. If you've ever planted directly into fresh compost, you know exactly what I'm eating. You get some weak, weak, <laughs> type plants that end up coming out of that. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, the levels are or anything like that. So I can't really comment. Um, I'm going to assume the pH is a little acidic, but I, again, I'm not sure. If someone out there has like a good pH meter and uh, is able to test for me, please do send me the results. I will thank you forever. Um, and when you test the pH, I can figure out what the electric conductivity is from there, especially if you tell me what pH meter you have, because EC and pH are actually 
directly related. It's just a fun play there. So I did ask if there's been any studies on microbial activity or beneficial microbes that exist after the comp, um, composting process has taken place taken place. And so they did say that they had the end product tested using a microbiometer soil test kit to evaluate the micro microbial biomass, the fungal biomass um, to ratio or bacterial ratio. So it kind of goes on to explain to me um, what the benefits of microbes are and what their purpose is and what they do and how they store nitrogen and blah, 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 or start, how they store carbon um, and all that sort of stuff. But what they did send me is this bar graph that I'll pop up on the screen. Um, and in it, it's not helpful to me um, at all <laughs> because I, first of all, don't know what the control is. They say soil. I don't know if that's like an empty lot beside their building that has had nothing growing in it for the last 10 years or if it's like the um, highly organic community garden in their area. Is it maybe like a prairie soil natural ecosystem? Is it like a ditch off the side? Of the I don't know where the soil came from. So I can't comment on why the fungal bodies are so low or why the bacterial bodies are so high compared to the grow uh, with loamy pod, which is like considered the highest, um, nor can I comment on why the carbon is so low. I'm assuming if the carbon's so low, it's either really heavy clay or really, really sandy soil. It's on either one of the extremes because 126 UGs of carbon per gram of soil is pretty low. So that's like not a normal soil. That's not a garden soil by any means. So just something to keep in mind there. Another thing I'd like to add to this is I'm assuming a lot of loamy people would be using this for more houseplants, not necessarily the garden. It's not like we're mass producing compost here with a loamy system. So I would assume that a better control would actually be looking at peat moss or coconut coir mixes more so than anything um but that would heavily throw off the carbon content because then peat moss and coconut coir would be likely competing with like the grow with loamy pod option at 820 that's probably where i'm assuming uh peat moss would be up in and around as well as the fungi in a potting soil is going to be naturally very high because it's from a forest ecosystem especially if it's a, a peat moss based uh product if it's a coconut coir based product i would expect it to be on the lower end and then bacteria i would expect to actually be lower both in peat moss and coconut coir than that of maybe the loamy in and of itself so i don't find any of these results to be statistically significant in any means when it comes to percentage or anything like that um the only one that has you know, a really high fungal count is the grow with loamy pod. And that is because the loamy pod is something they call a proprietary blend of fungi and bacteria. It's essentially a soil inoculant is what it is. It's similar to like a microbe um, addition. I don't know what's in the proprietary blend. I don't like when companies do that because that's of no use to the gardener. Trust me, Lomi, no one's gonna run away into the sunset and try to like colonize your special microbes that you have. We just wanna know what's in there. Um, mostly because I would be interested to know if there's mycorrhizal fungi um, and specifically end or acto, what species, what strains. Are they beneficial to houseplants? Are they beneficial to the gardener? Which plants are they forming symbiosis with? That sort of thing. That would make it a lot easier for Lomi to say like, hey, this Lomi pod is for gardeners, this Lomi pod is for houseplant people, and this is why. It's because it has endo and ectomycorrhizal fungi, da 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 You know what I mean? I just, yeah. Anyways, maybe I just gave them a good idea. <laughs> that would be cool if they split those in half because they're gonna have drastically different names. The garden people are gonna need more like North American type uh, garden soil microbes compared to like exotic houseplant folk you're going to need drastically different ones as well. So again, nothing statistically significant there when it comes to the, the microbe biomass in the Lomi. 
Really nice high carbon ratios though, which is always beneficial to your plants, um, always beneficial to your soil. If you incorporate this into your soil, either as a mulch or if you decide to till it in, if you decide to put this um, seed placed in the hole, like um, root placed, rises here placed, I mean, really, really good stuff. My only concern with putting it as a mulch before seeds have sprouted is that we may get some allelopathic tendencies, some chemical releases that naturally take place in any composting process, but especially with a loamy system that hasn't been allowed to decompose long-term. I mean, heat and grinding or dehydrating and grinding isn't, decomposition has to take the time it takes. It's not something you can necessarily speed up. Now, I do think the loamy, just the grinding and the dehydrating is going to speed it up because we have more surface area after the food's ground up and dissolved um, into this sense. But I don't think it's that fast. I know it's not that fast. So I wouldn't um, top dress with this in a seed starting situation. I wouldn't rise a sphere, place it in with all my plants, I would try like one or two and see if I have stunted growth from it. If you don't have stunted growth, then go ahead and fill all your plant holes up with it. But if you, you're noticing like cupped leaves, like turning down cupped leaves or um, a slowdown in growth, loamy is something you don't want to place rises spherically, but you can transplant, cover the transplant area, and then actually top dress with loamy. There's no reasons why you can't do that. That would work just just fine. So I asked about why it's so quick, how it works, and they just kind of said that it's a combination of differentiating heats, dehydrating, grinding, um, and they say that there is decomposition that takes place, but I don't, again, there's no, there's nothing I know of, unless it's proprietary blend of microbes that they have in their little pod thing is, really, really good. Um, and there's nothing I know of that decomposes food in 24 hours. That's just not, it's not possible. So that is something to keep in mind there. But yeah, I did ask some other questions like, is it hydrophobic? So sometimes when peat uh, will dry out completely or compost dries out completely, um, not so much Veracast actually, but the compost in the peat um, when it dries out too much, it almost is hydrophobic. So you'll find that your peat will float and stuff like that. And that's just natural because it, I like to always compare it to a Pantene Pro V commercial. The, uh, blades on the peat are all laying down nicely. And so it's like a hull of a ship. If you put it in the water, it just kind of sails along the top because there's no roughage. Uh, but once the water kind of gets in and breaks into the peat a little bit, it kind of looks like a frayed hair a little bit more and that kind of sinks the ship, all the little holes sink the ship. So that's what happens. That's what hydrophobic, for, um, what seems to be hydrophilic once it actually gets the holes blown in the ship, um, that sort of thing. So. Uh, they said that the Lomi byproduct is not hydrophobic whatsoever, and this is likely due to the fact that it's not too, too hot. It doesn't get really, really warm, which is very, very nice. And then I did ask out of pure curiosity, because if I ever did get my hands on one of these things for $400, I would uh, definitely have tried this without asking. So thank goodness I did ask. But um, I asked if you can sterilize or treat potential uh, houseplant soil, so uh, peat-based soil, specifically organic-based soil, so soil-less would be the better word there. But I asked if you can, you know, put in powdery mildew type uh, stuff and that sort of thing. They said no, that is a big no-go. And I probably, if I'm having like fungal issues with my soil, I wouldn't be putting in the loamy because you're not gonna kill the spores. The spores are likely going to survive and come and kick your butt later on in life anyways. But that maybe for like fungus and that or something. They said don't do it. Not recommended. So there you go. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on electric composters. If you did, be sure to give the video a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Let me know in the comments down below what you want to see in the next video. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.